10. Uh, this, uh, once you are there, we can read together. Uh, those of you who are here for the very first time, welcome. Uh, most of our guys have gone out for, for the holiday. But um, I am so happy that you have chosen to come and worship with us this afternoon. Uh, just to, as we remember the other, what Christ did for us. So Isaiah 53 from verse number 1 says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of drying ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with the pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a ram to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off uh, from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. Verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done, done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, this afternoon as we reflect on those ones of Isaiah and this day as we reflect on the day when you are put on the cross and nailed there and give up your spirit. Lord, we pray that help us to remember this day and as we reflect about it, help us, Lord, to identify with what you did for us that we were not worthy, but Lord, you found it worthy to take up our punishment and die on our behalf. And so, Lord, we pray and we are grateful that this day brought us peace. Uh, this day brought us a restoration and a reconciliation with you. Help us, Lord, even as we reflect on these ones, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, looking at what Isaiah says, Isaiah is asking like a question, who has believed our message? If you look from verse number one, who has believed our message? And then he talks about to whom has the heart of the Lord been revealed. Now, what Isaiah is saying here, he was saying that, uh, you know, the way Christ came, the way the Messiah appeared on the scene, it's like no one was led to believe that actually this Jesus was the Messiah. That's why Isaiah begins by asking, and who, to whom has the harm of the Lord been revealed to? And then Isaiah goes on and on and on to talk about Christ. And even as we think about this day, now going down there, Isaiah talks about it in a deeper way. Now, if you go to verse, um, if you go to verse number, if you go down to verse number number six, um, if you go to verse number number five, number four. Let me go to verse number four. Uh, let me start from verse three. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. You see the way Christ really suffered on the cross. And as we reflect on what was happening to him, what was happening to his body, uh, the pain, the humiliation, and above all, Death on the cross. Now, according to the Roman customs, the worst punishment that could be given to somebody who was very erroneous 
was to crucify them. And so when now the, 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 the authorities decided, let's have Jesus crucified, it was the most humiliating punishment a person could be given. And of course, they put him at a place called Gorogoda where there were the crossroads. It was like a place of crossroads where many roads were meeting. And they hung him there when he was almost naked. And uh, they humiliated him with all kinds of abuse and insult because of you and me. As we think about this, one thing that I would want you to know, that it is you who actually should be on the cross. It was you because of your sin. It was me because of my sin and not Christ, because Christ had done no wrong. And as we think about this day, and what he went through because of you and me, and because of your sin, because that was your punishment, that was my punishment, and they took it in stride, and they agreed to die on the cross so that he could be able to set us free. And as I was reflecting on this mystery of salvation today, I was wondering, why, why did God have to do that? Why did the Son of God had to suffer all that much? And then I came across a few statements that were given by people. And I also looked at the very last ones that Jesus spoke of. I mean, spoke when he was on the cross, when he was being crucified, when he was about to die. There are some several things that Jesus said. And I was looking at those statements and I saw a great heart of love, a great heart of mercy and compassion. Now, and I also looked at some of the statements that have been said by people who are about to die. I don't know if you are about to die, what you would tell the people who would be around you uh, as we are gathered here today. Now, I just came across a statement that was done by Karl Marx, who died on 14th March in 1883. His housekeeper uh, came to him and told him, tell me your last ones, and I'll write them down. You know, Karl Marx was a great uh, socialist of the time. And when he was told by his housekeeper, please tell me your very last ones, so that I can escape them down, and I can be able to give whoever, uh, you know, would want to know about you. And Karl Marx told him, he replied, go on, get out. Last ones are for fools who haven't sinned enough. He chased him away. Go away. Because those ones are sent by a fool. Uh, last ones are those for fools. And then I came across also, the last ones that were sent by somebody called uh, Mbanham. Um, now, Mbanham, when he was dying, uh, these are the ones that he said, he asked, what were today's receipts? Because the guy should have been a businessman. I mean, what did we receive today? <laughs> because the business was just ringing in his mind. I also came across the ones that were said by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest, um, I mean, generals to have lived in the, around in the 17th century. And uh, when he was dying, he said, the one thing that he shouted was, Chief of the army, that is what he said, because that was the guy was uh, like a mad guy. And uh, if you look at the books of history, you find some books say that the guy was a bank smoker and he was such a terrible, he was actually a terror. Because one time he walked from France, he was from France, he walked from France to Moscow during winter to go and conquer Moscow. He was a terror and one of the greatest I mean, generals to have ever lived who conquered Europe between 1789 to around 1792. For 11 years, the guy literally conquered Europe. It was such a terror, and nothing could stand on his way. So when he was dying, he said, I'm the chief of the army, because that was what was in his mind. I also looked at ones that were said by Jesus Christ when he was dying, uh, what he said. Now, before I come to Jesus, now let me look at also another one that was said by somebody called Charles Spanjon. Now, he was a, a Baptist preacher, a great Baptist preacher. And when he was dying, uh, this is what he said. He said, um, Jesus died for me. That's what he said. So, Spanjon, you have come across his writings, his commentaries. He's a great, I mean, a theologian. Uh, he was a Baptist. And he said, Jesus died for me. And I also came across ones that were said by uh, the founder of the Methodist Church by name John Wesley. When he was dying, he said, 
the best of all is God is with us. Can you see the difference between the great Amin general, the businessman, Barnham, um, Charles Spangel, and also John Wesley? You can see the way they were putting it. There were those, those that were in the business field, their minds were ringing business. Those that were Christians, you can see Spangel says, Jesus died for me. Um, Wesley says, the best of all is that God is with us. And so friends, as we reflect on these ones, um, we are thinking about Christ. We are thinking about the death of Christ on the cross. Um, the journey that he began when he was entering Jerusalem on a donkey on that Saturday, uh, that faithful Saturday, he, was, he came to Jerusalem as a king and they were singing and dancing and riding up along the road, you know, because Jesus Christ, the king, was entering the city of Jerusalem. And remember, I, one, there are those ones that I really love. When Christ saw, I mean, from Jerusalem looked down and saw the mountain of olives. And it, from the mountain of olives looked down and saw Jerusalem. And the Bible says, he wept with a loud voice and said, Oh, to you, Jerusalem. I wish you knew the day of your visitation. You would have accepted me. He looked at Jerusalem and he wept over it. And this is a king on a donkey uh, walking down to Jerusalem. And when he came to Jerusalem on Sunday, he was a priest because he found the money changers and he, he wiped them, beating them seriously and chasing them away from the church because they had made the church you know, like a business place, like a marketplace where people are uh, selling doves, they were selling goods for sacrifice, they were money changers were there. He beat them and chased them out of the temple. And of course, on Monday, he becomes a prophet. He walks to Jerusalem as a prophet. And so, friends, as we think about this, my attention was caught by some of the important ones on this pitiful Friday. You know the story from Monday all the way to today. And so today, we look at Christ before our Pontius Pilate where these people, the religious leaders conspired. Let's have this guy killed. Now, I, was, I, I went about trying to find out why were these guys, why were they so heartless? They could just conspire to have somebody innocent killed. And actually, I came across in the book of Acts, if you study the book of Acts properly, you realize why they crucified Christ. It is not because of any sin that he had done. It is not because he claimed to be God, but it was actually out of envy. And I came to realize the worst enemies of mankind, it is envy. Envy is bad. Envy is a bad thing. Envy can crush anyone. Envy is one of the worst things that we can talk about. And this is why they wanted Christ killed. Because... He would pass by, he raises a dead person, he heals a sick guy, opens blind eyes. And they were like, we have been here for all this long with the religious leaders and we have not been able to do these things. How come that Christ is doing all this? And actually, that's why they turned against him. There was no other reason. It was because of envy. Why is this guy doing so much? Why are people talking so fond of him? And they actually conspired to have him killed. And so we reflect on this Friday when Jesus now is on the cross. Now one of the things when he was put there the first thing if you look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, Jesus said Father forgive them for they know not what they are doing. The first thing that Jesus did was to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Despite where he was, despite the circumstances that he was facing, despite the pain and the humiliation, despite what he was, you know, because he was sure it was imminent death, Jesus, he looks at God and acknowledges the place of authority of God. And so friends, this evening as we sit here this afternoon, are you recognizing the authority of God over your life? Are you recognizing the sovereignty of God over your life? Jesus in his pain, in this howl of need, when all was, all odds were against him, he acknowledged the sovereignty of God. 
He looked at God the Father. He says, forgive them, Lord. Father, forgive them. And now look at this great heart of Christ, a heart of mercy, a heart of compassion. Even with all the pain and the humiliation that he was going through, and everyone was like his enemy, he says, Lord, Forgive these people. He sought your forgiveness. He sought my forgiveness. He was saying, Lord, forgive them. Why was Christ doing that? Because he knew that we needed exactly that forgiveness. So he says the first thing, acknowledging the place of God the Father, he speaks to his Father in heaven. And he tells him, Father, forgive these people. The torturers, the people who are whipping him, the people who are calling him names, says, Father, Forgive these people, for they know not what they are doing. And so, friends, this evening, when Jesus was there, suffering, uh, pain, humiliation, rejection, he looks at God. He looks at the heart of love that was in him, was very expressive. He expressed love for humanity by saying, Lord, forgive them. And so this evening as you sit here, I want to tell you, remember, you have been forgiven. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. Forgive these children who are weird. He had unconditional divine love and forgiveness. How many times have you held on to unforgiveness? Someone has hurt you and you say, I'll die with this one. How many times has somebody hurt you? And even as you sit here, you are experiencing the pain of the heart. Imagine if you are in the place of Jesus. Sometimes I think if it was me in my human nature and nikijua niko na hiyo kanguvu Yesu alikuwa nayo. Ningesema Yesu first of all God make them bright. All these people. Hao wako hapo chini hao wananiteza. Make the more of them bright so that you don't see me. And then God open their eyes again so that as I die they will know I was God. <laughs> make all of them bright for a moment. And then maybe you can open their eyes now. Let them kill me. I mean, Jesus looks at God. No vengeance. No pain. No regret. Says, Lord, forgive them. And the second thing, Christ's love knows no boundaries. If you look at Luke 23 and verse 43, he speaks to the criminal on the cross. Now, this criminal, there was a thief there. And somebody, there's a creep that was going on on our pages, uh, on our pastor's page. And this creep is saying, when I go to heaven, this preacher is saying, when I go to heaven, I will ask that thief, how did you get here? Because you have never attended any Bible study. You have never attended any fellowship. You have never attended any, uh, you don't belong to any church. I mean, you have no church membership. How did you get here? And the thief will say, I don't know. And then he goes on to say, that king goes on to say, and then he will come and be an angel, come and help me. And the angel will ask him, how did you get here? And finally the thief says, the man who was at the mineral cross told me to come. And I came. Praise the Lord. He bid me come. Because Jesus told him in the book of Luke 23, 43, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in the paradise. Today, because the other thief was arguing insults at Christ. And people were surrounding him, beating him, and doing all sorts of things. And now at that moment, at that hour, Jesus, this hour of pain, this thief tells the other thief, can you stop abusing the, the Lord Jesus? Because we are here because of our sin, because of what we have done. But he is here, he has committed no sin. And Jesus looks at this the infant tells him, today you will be with me in paradise. And sure it was. That is the only guy who went express. He went to heaven express. Because he acknowledged the supremacy and the sovereignty of Christ. He acknowledged what God, who God was, and the place of God in his life. He acknowledged that it was God. He acknowledged that Jesus is Lord. And so friends, as we sit here this, morning, this afternoon, it is about forgiveness. 
You have been forgiven your sins. I have been forgiven my sin. And Christ is still ready to forgive you. Whatever that you have done, Christ is always ready to forgive you. And once he forgives you, you receive the mystery of this salvation that he gives freely to them that acknowledge, uh, acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. And so friends, this morning, this evening as we gather here, what is in your mind? Look at this thief. He recognized Christ. Do you recognize him? And the third thing I want to say, Jesus demonstrated his heart of humanity. You know, if you look at Luke, John 19 verse 26, we see the mother of Jesus was standing there near the cross. Jesus turns and sees his mother. Uh, if you look at 19 verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciples whom Jesus loved nearby, he sent to, 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 to his mother, dear woman, here, he was pointing at John, the disciple John, here is your son. And he told John, here is your mother. And actually the Bible records that from that day, John, the apostle John, took Mary, the mother of Jesus, as his mother. And he took her home. And he started taking care of her. Now, Jesus looked at the pain that his mother was going through. As a mother, seeing your son dying, as a mother, the pain of losing your son, and you can see it and there is nothing you can do, and there is no replacement. And actually the other brothers of Jesus were, were not even nearby. So Jesus looks at John, the favorite disciple. He tells him, dear woman, that is your son. And then he tells jo John, that is your mother. You know, a heart of humanity, demonstrating that he was feeling the pain. He was empathizing with the mother. How can I just die, leave my mother anguishing? And so he told his mother, you have another son. Don't worry about me. And actually, that was it. Now, Jesus looking at the mother with compassion, wearing a human body. He was God, but demonstrating humanity, looking at the mother and telling the mother, don't worry, don't cry, you have a son. Jesus demonstrated that he was human in every way. And if you look at something else that Jesus did, at the cross, in the book of Matthew 27, verse 46, when it was about the hour, 3 p.m., we are actually in that hour, 27, 46, the Bible says, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, um, saying, hurry, hurry, lama sabakadhani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is New King James Version. Now, on Jesus here, when it was about 3 p.m., after he had taken up our sin, and he was completely tainted by the things that we had done, it looked as if God had abandoned him. It looked as if God and completely left him. It looked as if God was not with him. And the Bible says, he, he cried with a loud voice, my father, why have you forsaken me? Because he was now a sinful person. Because he had taken our sin. And so he cries to the father, have you for, forgotten me? Have you forsaken me? And the Bible records that when he said that, um, it was the darkest hour of his suffering. Because he was bruised. He was painting everywhere, crying with a loud voice. This once that Jesus was speaking, in one way, it was a fulfillment of scripture, uh, the book of Psalm 22. Because Psalm 22 opens up with words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I cry, you know, it was, the psalmist says, I cried out. Why have you turned away from me? That's what the psalmist says. Maybe I can read that. Now, Psalm 22, let me just read how it is put. Psalm 22, verse 1, this is what um, the psalmist says. The psalmist says uh, from the, verse number 1, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me, from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. You know, Jesus was crying a cry of anguish. And actually when he was saying that, he was fulfilling the scripture because every scripture had to be fulfilled. He was actually kind of cross-referencing and fulfilling what was said in the Old Testament. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as Jesus was saying that, that it was his hour of deepest anguish. We see the father like turning, turning him away because of, he was turning away from him because of the weight of sin that Jesus was bearing. I'm telling you, it was so heavy. The burden of sin. Your sin and my sin was so much. That weight was so huge that God at a moment looked away and Jesus cried with a loud voice. And that brings us to the fifth thing. Jesus says, I am thirsty. Now, when he said that, he was fulfilling again another scripture in the Old Testament. As Psalms 69, 21. If you look at Psalms 69 and verse number 21. As uh, 69, 21. Uh, Jesus again. The Bible says, they put God in my food and give me, gave me vinegar for my thirst. Now, gall was some bitter substance. Uh, if you look at some of the biblical, extra biblical materials, they say it was some extract and fluid, like from the barrel, I mean, barrel, barrel of, a, of an animal that was very bitter. And they were using it to give somebody who was going through a lot of pain to, to reduce or relieve the pain. And so when they gave him gall, it was very bitter, you know, uh, that, that substance, that liquid uh, from the, that substance. In Akuanga, Kari Sana. And they gave him to drink. And of course, when they put on his mouth, he spit it away. And so, he, when he said that he was dusty, he was fulfilling that scripture in the book of Psalm 69, 21. That Jesus knew everything was now finished. And he had to fulfill the scriptures. He said, I am dusty. Now, why didn't Jesus refuse to take vinegar and gar and marrow that they had put in his mouth? Um, why did he do that? Because they were giving him that substance to reduce the pain that was going through his body. But there, it was, we see, it was there, it was actually, he was fulfilling the Messiah prophecy that was in the book of Psalm 69, 21. As a, as a Messiah, it talks about the Messiah and what will happen. And so every scripture had to be fulfilled. And Christ cries in a loud voice, I am dusty. And why? So looking at this, he was actually fulfilling every word that is in the word of God. And finally he says, uh, he says I, it is finished. Now that was a shout of triumph over sin. He, say, he was saying, I have completed the task. He was saying, I have won the victory. He was saying, I have overcome. Now, if you look at John 19 verse 30, Jesus said, it is finished. I have overcome. I have done it. You know, it's like when you run a race, when you see uh, this good Adreti Kipchoge, uh, this Erwin Kipchoge, when he runs a race and he finishes the race, any, any Adreti, when they cross the finish line, they, you know, some of them bah, kneel down and pray. And as they are given the flag, they run around the, the, the field with the flag, you know, raising it up of their country, demonstrating victory or, you know, showing a shout of triumph. I have made it. I have overcome. I have won the victory. Now Christ on the cross, as we reflect on this day, he said, it is finished. He said, it is finished. A shout of triumph over sin. I have completed the task. Now Jesus knew he was suffering the crucifixion for a purpose. If you look at John 10, 18 of his life, he was saying, he said, Jesus said himself, John 10, 18, 
that no one takes it from me. He was talking about his life. And he was saying, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. You know what Jesus said? You can see what he was saying there in John 10, 18. He's saying no one can take away his life. All the guys who are trying to kill him, actually they could not. If he was not willing. He says, no one can take my life away from me. But I, I will give, I lay it down on my own accord. So he was willing. He died on the cross willingly. He took the pain willingly. He took the humiliation willingly. Because he says, no one takes it from me. But I lay it down on my own accord. And then he says, I have authority to lay it down and also authority to take it up again. Yeah, this command I received from my father. Friends, this is so huge. No one could take away the life of Christ. Because he would have turned those guys bright. You remember Elisha, what he did? I mean, when I mean he made those guys bright. Was it Elisha or Elijah? <laughs> like, I normally confuse those two guys. He just, they just became bright. They couldn't see him. And actually, he just he walked away. And then he led them to a different direction. And what am I trying to say? Jesus had the power to do anything, to punish them, and to, to do anything he wanted with them. But he did not want, because he wanted to redeem you. He wanted to set you free. He wanted you to, be, to, be, to receive the gift of salvation. Friends, it was because of your sin. It was because of your salvation that Christ had to suffer. It was because of you, because of the things that you had done. And it was because of what you had done that Christ had to die on the cross. And you see, now he was telling the father, Father, what you sent me to do, I have done it. Faithfully, I have taken it. And this final act of obedience was complete. Because you can see what he says in the book of John. No one can take away my life. But I laid down my life willingly. And so, friends, this, this evening as we sit here, look at that sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Look at that willingness. Look at that love. Look at, you know, those hands that were spread because of compassion. Those hands that were spread to embrace you. However, how sinful you were. How bad you had been to and committed. Jesus did not count them against you. He actually took your place. Friends, see when Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, and then the final thing that I want to say, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke chapter 23, verse 14, but that's 46. 23, 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice. When he had said this, he breathed his last. You know, when Jesus did all that, he called out with a loud voice, and then he breathed his last. Now, if you look at Psalms that are one five, speaking to God the Father, we see a complete trust in his heavenly Father. Jesus entered death the same way he lived each day of his life, offering up his life as a perfect sacrifice, placing himself in, in the hands of God the Father. Now, Psalms that one five, what does that say? Now, Psalm that one five, this is what the psalmist says. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, uh, my Lord, my faithful God. Let me repeat. It says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Into your hands I commit. This is the psalmist again. So Jesus was really a scorer of, he knew the Old Testament. He knew the scriptures. Because you can see the ones that he was, say, he was saying on the cross, on that Friday, he was referencing everything from the Old Testament. Are you a student of the word? Because it is only the word of God that can change and transform your life. Not what your pastor says. Allow me to say this. 
What can keep you going and make you able to stand any temptation and climb any mountain of life? It is not what your pastor says, but what the scriptures say. So Jesus here, we see him. Every time he's saying something, he's actually doing a cross-reference in the Old Testament. And friends, when Jesus told the Father, I commit my spirit in your hands, I commit my spirit, and then he died. There's something that's very unique that happened. Now what happened in the temple, there was the curtain that was separating the place where the congregation was sitting and the place where there was a box that was called the mercy seat. Now, on the mercy seat, no one was supposed to enter there except the high priest. And he was only entering there once a year. And he would go there carrying blood of a, a lamb without blemish. And he would go, he would be tied with a rope on, on, on his leg. And the, the other leg would be having a bell. So the people would wait holding the rope the other side. When they heard the, 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 the noise of the bell, they would know the high priest is still doing the, you know, interceding for our, uh, I mean, forgiveness. And so he would go around the mercy seat, you know, sprinkling blood. And as they would hear the noise of the bell, they would know the guy is working. If the bell went quiet, they would pull the rope and get him out because the guy would die. Because if you had any sin and you entered the Holy of Holies, you are supposed to die. Now, what happened on this day when Christ died, on this Friday today? When Jesus died, the curtain that was separating the Holy of Holies and the place where the audience was staying, iripasukia katikati. Meaning now, the body of Christ was like, it, it opened up the, 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 the place for everyone to access the mercy seat by himself. Anyone can access the mercy seat to go and repent their sin. Anyone can access God and request for whatever you want in the name of Jesus and you receive. That is why we don't, we as, um, especially the Pentecostals, we, didn't, don't, and we don't tell people to come to us to repent their sins. Because when that curtain broke, uh, was torn at the mineral, anyone can access God. Anyone can access God. And you can go to God and tell him your petition. Sometimes you can ask the pastor to help you, to pray with you. That is fine. Maybe that can also strengthen your faith. But what Jesus was saying, when that curtain was torn... He was saying, there is now no longer any barrier where you can be sending somebody to go and do the intercessions for you. The doors are open. You can access God. Anytime, anywhere, you can access God on your own. And you can access him as your father. And you can tell him whatever that which you want. So Jesus was saying that now it is done. There is now no longer any barrier. Anyone can come to the Father direct and plead their case. Anyone can seek forgiveness independent of the high priest. Anyone can access God without using any intermediaries. And friends, this is a very important day in the Christian calendar. If you look at Romans chapter 5, let me cross with that. Uh, Romans chapter 5. Um, sorry, where am I? Yeah, Romans chapter 5. I'll look from verse number 5. This is what the Romans uh, says. Uh, Romans 5 and verse number 5. It says, And the hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see? At the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse number six, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse seven, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. Friends, if you look at verse number six, it says, when we were still powerless, let me tell you, sin has power. Sin has power. And I would demonstrate what I mean by sin has power. Imagine a patient goes to the doctor. The doctor, they do examinations on him or her. And they tell this patient that your problem is drunkenness, is alcoholism. Your liver, your, 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 your vital organs are burning up. You must stop drinking or else you die. And that person cannot stop. They will leave the doctor. I have actually seen two. I've talked to two. One of them was told, you have you type 2 diabetes, a relative of mine. And talking to this guy, he told me, Can you be a pome where you are? Then drinking cannot kill anyone. Nichakura too. That's the idea. Can you be a human and a pona? Nika mambia deal. But come be at a father in doctors, they know what they're saying. Can you be a child and a how? Listen, Trey. I went home and I, there's a guy I used to give some bibaruas. So I went looking for him. And then I, I couldn't find him. Then I asked some of his friends. Who is Jamaa kwa nilewa kwa wapi simuoni? Waka cheka waka anguka. Nika wabuliza kwa nini muna ni cheka? Waka niambia. Au na abari. Who is Jamaa alikufa njurai last year? Nia was looking for the guy this January. Waka niwe. Waka niwe. Nika wabuliza kwa. Aya. Halikufa. And the guy was healthy and fine. They told me this. They told me. Halipiti haba akaenda pale. Because we were in a town. Aka kunywa, tukamuliza. My friend, ume kunywa na uliwambia usi kunywa. Aka wambia hindi ya mwisho. Haku wa muka siku yo. Alirara, enyewe ilikuwa ya mwisho. And the guy went. <laughs> so, sin has power. That's why Paul says, he tells the Romans, that while, when we were still powerless, we could not be able to redeem ourselves from the power of sin. We could not be able to set ourselves free from the dominion of sin and darkness. We could not save ourselves. Christ came and he died for us so that he could free us from the power of sin. I'm telling you, sin has power. It has power. Because Jesus knew you are ungodly. You could not be able to set yourself free. Jesus knew there is no way you are in bondage of sin. We were in bondage. And then he came and died for us. Ungodly as we were. If you are asked, for example, just to, to bring it nearer home, if you are asked if you could die for the person you love most, would you? Could be your husband, your child. Huh? You are told, <clears throat> this person has a heart problem, for example. And so they, if they are given your heart, they can live. Can you give? <laughs> Kevin, don't be scared. <laughs> can you give? Now, Jesus, that is what he did. He knew those people were bad. We were bad. He knew we were not worthy. He knew we were bad. We were in sin. But then he came and died for us. He demonstrated his love. While we were still sinners, while we were still powerless, while we were still not able, then Christ comes and dies for us. Friends, what can we say about this great love, great compassion that cannot be paralleled by anything? Someone in the status of God, dying for you and me, human beings, mortal men who are full of sin. And actually, we deserved to die because of, sin, of our, the punishment of what we had done. We deserved it. It was ours. But then Christ came and just took it and said, I take it on their behalf. If they only believe, like that thief on the cross, if they only believe, they are fine. It is mine now. This punishment, don't go on the Father. This punishment is mine. These people, if they only believe, then they'll be able to come to you. 
It is mine. This punishment is no theirs any longer. It is mine. I take it on their behalf. Friends, that is what Christ did for us today. And as we reflect on this day of Good Friday, that, that's the important lesson for us to know. That we could not free ourselves. We could not save ourselves. There is nothing, nothing could be done to atone for our sin. Because in the Old Testament, there was, the, 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 it's called actually the scapegoat, the book of Numbers. The scapegoat. Now the scapegoat, how was it operating? The priest would go and get a goat. And they would take a goat and confess all the sins of the people on that goat. The priest would confess the sins of fornication on the head of the goat. And then they would escort the goat from the tent to verify the wilderness. And the priest would release the goat to go away with the sins of people. That was the scapegoat in the book of Numbers. Now, me, I always wonder, what if the God came back? <laughs> what if the God found its way home? He would escort it very far and chase it completely to go away and the police would get back. And the only question that I have never been answered, I'm trying to look for it theologically. To understand it from the theological perspective, what if the God came back and it traced its way to, back to the home? What would have happened? So that was actually the scapegoat. The goat of atonement. And when the goat would go away with the sins, it is eaten by wolves in the wilderness, now the people would be forgiven. So Jesus came and he became the scapegoat. He took our sin. So there was no, there was no need to punish goats again with the sins of man. Because Jesus took it. He became the scapegoat. There's a very nice uh, word that is used in our mother tongue. I mean, my mother tongue puts it very nicely. Only that you cannot understand that French, French language. That God will just be taken away. Christ became that God. The scapegoat on our behalf. Let's bow down for a round of prayer. Lord, we are so grateful this afternoon that you took our punishment. That, Lord, you bore it all. That, Lord, it was you who took it on our behalf. What we deserved, Lord, you took it. We give you glory and honor and praise. Be glorified, God, and be adored. What is your name? We thank you. We bless your name, God Almighty. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. We love you. Thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you for forgiving our sin. So Lord, I ask this, more, this afternoon that even as we reflect and think of this day, Lord, let us know, allow us to know that Lord, it was because of love that you did what you did. It was because of love that you accepted to die. It was because of love that you took our place on the cross. And maybe you are here this afternoon and you are not saved. Would you want to receive Christ as your Savior? Because what Christ did was actually for you so that you can have salvation. Is there anyone who would want to say, Christ, I need you to save me today. This day will become a day of remembrance. Telling the Lord, Lord, save me. Because it is you you came to set me free. You came to redeem me from the dominion of sin and darkness. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Help us, Lord, to think about this. Help us, Lord, to reflect on this. Help us, Lord, to love you more and to think about you more all the days of our lives. We give you glory and honor, Lord. As we remember this day, Lord, Let's remember the reason for the season. As we celebrate, Lord, we are grateful. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe um, in case you came with your offering, we have the pinball numbers on the, on the walls. You can just send it there or put in the offering box. There is an offering box somewhere. A little offering box, you can drop it. 
and may the Lord bless you. I want us to sing that song, Kevin, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And then we can go. You can finish up and go. God bless you.